Hello everyone, um, and thank you so much for having me here today. I'm really, really, I feel very lucky and very honored to be here. So thanks so much for the um, Institute, of course, of Italian Culture, and to the Holo Museum. Um, just, I want to say that it was something that was incredibly unexpected, and like positively, uh, of course, um, surprising. But communication uh, with both institutes was absolutely seamless and was all very great to work with them. They were just like amazing at organizing everything. And this was just um, um, really good to, to witness. So thanks so much for having me here today. So first thing is, um, of course, hello. I'm here today to share a little bit of a story with you. And of course, it's a story that is uh, relevant to the, um, the name of the of the conversation today. So it's a story about a design process that informed a material research and that eventually turned to be um, a business opportunity for myself and the founder of the project. And uh, the story started, of course, with the first topic, which is observation. So just to give you like a little bit of an introduction on um, how we all went. Um, I started of course, here in London in 2008, when I graduated in the school. Um, this building is the old building for Central St. Martins College of Art and Design. Um, I was very lucky to be accepted there for a two years course, a master in industrial design. So my background was BA, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Industrial Design, and then I went into MA in Industrial Design. Industrial design. Um, and during um, the course, the universities, of course, is known for uh, getting students to push the boundaries of their disciplines. So it's about like introducing groundbreaking thinking and innovative approaches across very many different disciplines. Uh, Smart is very renowned for fashion, but of course that uh, methodology applies to all the courses. So when I was there, I developed a project about sound um, and how sound interacts with people in everyday situations. And uh, during this project, I had the pleasure to start working with glass. So, of course, I needed glass for its sound properties and for the fact that um, it was quite a common material in everyday use. Um, and I started working with a glass maker in London, so that was my first approach. Um, the beauty and the magic about this project was that I could be there in this workshop with this glass maker and we could literally make things together. So I would start blowing pieces and I was like, can you make it a bit bigger, a bit smaller? Can you touch this bit to this other bit? Can we make another color? And this is how I actually started to understand the material a bit better. And this is one of the ways of working with glass that we call like lab work. Um, and the material itself is called borosilicate glass because it's a glass that is injected with boro and makes it a bit stronger. To be um, like, to make it simpler is the glass that they use in the chemical industry, or um, in, in the industry it's called the Spirex. Um, so one of the pieces that came out from graduation was a set of carafe, it's a carafe for water and glasses. Um, that actually I brought here, but I left in the other room, I think. <laughs> Smart enough for me. Um, but anyway, this piece um, was quite successful in terms of press and um, and exhibitions. So it was published in quite a lot of magazines and newspapers and blogs, and it was acquired by the Shanghai Museum of Glass for the permanent collection, and it toured like in many different exhibitions. So what happened is that in 2011, I got a phone call from a gallery in Berlin, and they're like, hi, I would like to show your piece. And I was very young and naive, and I was like, oh yeah, but this piece is already old. It was six months old. And I didn't realize that in product design, product is young for many years that we saw before with Casino. So like this piece is already old, I want to bring something new, I want to work on something different. What about I bring experimental approaches into glass making? And the curator was like, wow, amazing, yeah, perfect. Okay, call me again when you're ready. I was like, okay, sure. Put on the phone, look around like, oh, oh, I think I did something really bigger than me this time. So I pick up the phone again and I call some friends that are based in Venice and this is where it all started. So end of 2011, I moved to Venice with these friends um, to, jo to join this uh, team of people and two of us co-founded this project called Breaking the Mold. So Breaking the Mold um, 
is a project that has got some features that I think are very smart. I don't know if you agree with me, but I thought we were very smart in this way that we uh, designed this project and we call it a platform. We call it a platform for experimental approaches into glass making. Platform meant it was open. Um, and every day we see more and more how design is becoming open source and there is influences and how it's becoming more multidisciplinary. But for us, the, um, the real, um, the, change, the turning point was that by making it open, of course, with a core, so we were like a core, two founders and two uh, members of the project, we made it open to people to contribute without having to pay them. So we would create different projects and always credit all the people, make them part of the project to the full, credit them in every project, but um, they could contribute with the knowledge and the skills without us having to pay different consultants. So this is how the platform became multidisciplinary. And of course, multidisciplinary means that it's informed because it's not just like a product designer, but it was a team of material scientists, video maker, photographers, communication designers. So we, we basically put up a whole team of people that could support us in creating something, creating an object, but only making it, also promoting it, and creating all the collateral materials that is needed to communicate a project. Because as you know, communication is fundamental, because you can create the most amazing thing, but then if you don't talk about this thing in the right way, then no one would see it. And the other thing is that we, we call it experimental approaches, but that doesn't mean that we just made something up and then we, so like, uh, you know, it was experimental with a method. And I can show you later if we have time. Uh, the website that we have is like collecting all the experiments we did in a very sort of scientific way. So we took like pictures, we record all the results, all the um, materials that we used, uh, all the temperatures of the glass, all the typologies of materials, as if it was an experiment made in a lab. So we actually, as I said, experimental means hands-on hands approaches. And we decided, of course, sorry, what I didn't say before is that we chose Venice because, um, I don't know if you all know, but in Venice there is, Venice is an island, and there is an island of the island called Murano. And Murano is where they make glass historically, uh, since 16th century. Um, so this is where they make glass, but they also, Murano is living a crisis. So in a way, we also wanted to work with a context that is like, is, is, is facing a challenge. And we wanted to see if our approach as designers could introduce or inject some levels of innovation without distorting what they could, know, what they could do already. So the idea was to observe what they can do, learn. So we spent a lot of time in the furnace observing, learning the techniques that the factories could um, master, actually. And then understand where we could introduce our action standards to, as I said before, introduce some little elements of innovation. So in here, um, and this also gave the name of the project, Breaking the Mold, because Venetian mold is known as artistic mold, as artistic, sorry, Venetian glass is known to be artistic glass, so we all know the little horses and little animals that they make, but actually Murano used to be the factory for glass in Italy, so they used to make light bulbs, it was the industrial glass for everyday projects. Um, so we wanted to take that approach because we were also industrial designers. So we started from what allow you to make objects in a series, so we use the mold, and specifically the wooden molds that they use on the island. And then we started coating the molds with different materials, the material scientists suggest that could work with glass. Um, glass also works at very high temperature, between like 1,200 Celsius and 900 Celsius. So basically everything that touches, catches fire. We set a few things on fire, that wasn't fun. So the material scientists actually advise on materials that we could use, that couldn't, that wouldn't burn away instantly, that weren't toxic, and that uh, could potentially be introduced in industrial or semi-industrial processes. So this is the first, ex the very first experiment we did was taking this wooden mold, coating it with this woolen ceramic uh, material, and we created this. Um, now I know it looks like a pretty awful lump of glass. 
but we were super happy. And the reason is that um, the superficial finish that you see here is something that the object came straight out of the mold. And I don't know if you know the history of glass, but like Benini worked with a very important architect called Scarpa, Carlo Scarpa. And for years they created all these sort of superficial effects with acid. So completely toxic as a process. Took a long time, a lot of skills, expertise, space, you know, waste. And we were like, wow, in one second we created something that Scarpa took like 10 years to develop with like a lot of toxic materials. Blah, blah. So it was actually the company right away at the time so that there was a potential for creating something that, that was very interesting. So we started from this very first test, we started with a lot more. So we started creating like little shapes, something not too complicated because again, like we were, you know, just after, after graduation, we didn't have lots of money, the company wasn't keen on investing too much because we weren't sure where the project was going. So keeping it simple, we made these shapes and again, we coated it with the materials that we, uh, the, the, um, the material scientists advised on and then we started blowing into it. So using the, te the Venetian techniques, what they can do with our molds. And this is what came out. So little by little, we started making more and more weird things. <laughs> and these were the, the results. Um, and little by little, we created a whole collection of 13 objects. Now they look quite small, but they're actually quite big, like they're quite tall pieces. Um, and all of these objects catch, they caught the attention of them, um, of course, like curators. So we did our first show in Berlin, as I said, and we presented it so that each object was kind of like uh, put into a system where we show like what material we use. So it's soda lime glass uh, with ceramic wool. Um, we use an old wooden mold. So we made, we created a system so that everything was, um, was looking like a professional experiment because we wanted to be able to reiterate it and inform the next processes. And of course, like we call all the pieces experiments. And still today, we call them experiments because we don't claim them to be final objects, but we want them to be something that is a work in progress. And the day we'll come out with something that is actually be able to put in production as an industrial object, then we call it an object. But so far, experiment one to experiment 30, 11, sorry, B, um, it's shown like a progression of different materials. For instance, this one was made using carbon fibers, but then carbon fibers proved to like work not very well with glass. Um, this one was made with a polymer that we um, we borrowed. It um, was quite interesting because we could en encase it in the glass, um, which is actually is this one here. So. The other complicated part is that in incorporating anything with glass is really difficult, but I'll tell you later in another, show you another experiment. So we did this, um, this show in Berlin, and for the show, not only we produce all the objects, but the way of presenting the objects, so um, a language, and then all the support for the communication. So we designed everything, the website, um, posters, and this was our first show ever. And we also brought like the malls to show people how um, you know, how these objects were made. So there was very first show in Berlin, very first experience, very stressed. We didn't want to know if it worked. It worked. We were like, yay, fantastic. And then what happened is that soon after, we were contacted by the Aram Gallery in London. Aram store is one of the biggest design shops in London. And on the top of the shop, they have um, a gallery. In the gallery, they usually do group exhibitions about experimental design. And for that show, they were like, we like your project, we'll give you a solo exhibition. We're like, wow, because very few people did a solo show in our and we're like, amazing. So again, for the show, we develop our communication, so we have, we have a title for the show, we develop like, the typography, all the print materials, and this is what the show looked like in the end. Again, we presented it with all the experimental uh, sort of bits, so like all the information about the materials. And then, um, after this project, we decided to run another project that is informed from the things that we learned before. So this time we used textile, 
uh, again, it's not just regular textile, it's like ceramic and um, glass textile. So it's the only things that can work with, um, with glass without burning. And we work with uh, Rebecca Hoyes, she's a textile designer that I met when I worked in Habitat. Um, and she let us use her workshop in London and she worked with us to produce like a number of different fabrics that we could blow the, the glass into. So we, we use like laser cutting, we use like application of the different uh, patches, uh, we use like some sort of uh, loom netting here. Um, and this is how you see like we blew the glass into those sort of uh, molds that we created. And the result was a collection of, another collection of little monsters <laughs> that we called Breaking the Mold 2. Um, and again, these are all called experiments again, but it's all about like experimenting superficial possibilities because all these things would be very expensive to gain with a wooden mold uh, or very long to make with a wooden mold. And these were made like instantly just by blowing into these fabrics. And then again, we did another exhibition in Venice, so in Biennale, and then again, we produced for every single show like our. Uh, communication, our typography, our titles. So we took it really seriously. We were like really determined to to present the project as professionally as we can, as we could. And then um, this is where the third part of the project started, which is actually the one that for me is the most exciting because um, this is we call breaking the mold three Venice future, and this we presented in Milan in 2014 in a gallery in Ventura Lombrate. And the idea was to really pushing the boundaries. So Murano is known for crafts and we were we thought why don't we introduce some actual innovation and novelty, something that is really contemporary, so like boards and circuits. Um, so what we did, we started working with a person that um, again in our platform system we invited this guy that um, created a 3D printer for ceramic and then we involved the material scientist to advice on a specific type of ceramic that could work with glass. So we developed a recipe for the ceramic and we developed like a special nozzles and special um, coding for being able to extrude the ceramic through a 3D printer. And again, when, went to Venice again. <laughs> and we produced a series of experiments. Um, so we started printing all these um, these bits in ceramic, then we fired them, we took them to the furnace, all these bits, and then we started seeing how they work with glass, of course, because it's not just about a ceramic. And what happened is that the glass was being blown directly into the ceramic bits. And the ceramic wouldn't break, and then the pieces would go in the kiln and would be tooled and would go through every single step of the process together with the glass. So for us, it was real, um, we haven't seen anything like this before, so we were like really pleased because it was the first time that someone was able to match the two materials together. In fact, when we showed in Milan, they were like, oh, are they glued together? I'm like, no, this is the whole principle of the project. They work together because there is a chemical research about how the materials actually if interact. Can I ask a question, Susan? Of course. Uh, if the sand is into the bottom or a plaster? Uh, this one here is just um, is a bucket with um, this one. You mean? Yeah, it's a bucket full of sand, and the reason is that basically some, as you see here, some of the ceramic bits are fired, the white ones, the red ones are not fired, so they were more fragile. So, but it's green or it's uh, it's wet, it's green. No, it's it's dried, but it's not fired. So in in the ceramic sort of um, slang is called a biscuit. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's fragile as a biscuit, but kind of like um, hard. Um, so this bit would go, sorry, in the bucket here, but for allowing it not to break with the pressure of the glass, we fill the bucket with, um, with sand, so that the sand would counterpart the pressure of the glass being blown. And this is the fabric that we produced. So I better than the ones before, I guess. Um, but yeah, you can see that 
it's basically we were basically trying to print different shapes because there was a lot like of difficulties, of course, in uh, also in three D printed ceramic because three D printed three D printing is a process of layering um, layers on top of each other. So there is a chance that some bits could collapse um, if you don't dry them enough. So again. These are all experiments, but they're a lot closer to look like a finished product. And again, this was very successful in terms of many museums um, asked for it, and um, um, it's been shown in, in, in loads of interesting institutions. What I wanted to show you is how then that project that received was really well received by the press in general, by the public, etc. The project turned into a business opportunity for myself and for the people that were involved in the project. So the four of us, the core members of Breaking the Mold um, team, we were all sort of hired by Salviati, who is the manufacturer that produced our glass pieces, to become part of the art directors and creative directors of the company. And um, we were, as I said, like the press got a quite a lot of interest and we were lucky enough to have the Monocle magazine. They were like, oh, we like your um, project, we would like to come to Venice and feature the project. So they came with the video maker and uh, they featured a short story. And they basically told the story on how we were hired by the company. And I think it's nice to hear it from an external point of view and from a professional journalist that tells how we got there. So I'm just gonna play the video so you can see it. From different disciplines, who go by the name of Breaking the Mold. And true to their name, their mission is to crack open traditional techniques and excavate them for contemporary design possibilities. They formed a unique partnership with heritage firm Salviati, which is providing exclusive access to centuries of know-how for Breaking the Mold's culture of ideas. The project is an experimental approach to something that is very traditional, very traditional techniques of glass making. And what is interesting for us is the innovative approach. And it is that we want to respect the legacy of the ground glass, but also we want to introduce some levels of, of novelty and innovation. Salviati appreciate what new blood can contribute to their future, so they've opened up their archives dating back to the firm's origins way back in 1850 to this troop of designers. I feel very privileged every time I walk in this place. I can witness the production and I can witness all this stratification of history and knowledge that is still manifesting itself today. It's very valuable because you can see somehow truly growing the way different personalities have interpreted glass. And also you can see the technical difficulties behind such material that is so fragile, but it's also quite heavy and can be treated and worked and tooled in very, very many different ways. Probably the younger generation is more involved in passion on the, I think, the handcraft. Because they understand that, that there is a big value in it. The big, big result and the big, big uh, surprise that they have uh, is linked to the people in the factory. Because when they understand that it's possible to cross another, another way to do it, that's open the mind and give us the possibility to go ahead. It's a new, a new story, it's a new story. It can be a really good story. Formulating modern strategies that honor traditions without being bound to them is key to reinvigorating this glass-making community on the island that has, in recent years, struggled to survive. And working with new talent who find novel ways of working with this fragile but palpable material is an alchemy well worth investing in. Glass is always beautiful to look at, and it is relevant. I think it should feel more contemporary, and it could feel more contemporary. And this is probably the challenge that we're trying to face here today with this project, Breaking the Mold, and with this company, Salviati. And there is many, many things that could be explored in terms of color, textures, shapes, uh, ways of working with glass, just thinking outside the box. Because it's a very old material, so it, it is difficult to think differently about it. Breaking the mold, make us young, sorry, fingers crossed. In Murano, for Monocle, I'm Jermaine Tobias. All this was to say as well, like what we, um, what we saw before, our 
What I think was really powerful for us was the importance of being designers, being able to go and talk to manufacturers, because this is what we, what is really strong in Italy and what we should really protect and foster, because there is an incredible pool of really talented companies making amazing work. And we couldn't have done this project without having a partner like Salviati producing our pieces. So this is also what I wanted to say. Um, we basically did what the, our masters did. So like Magistretti or Castiglioni, like all these people, they all went to talk to the manufacturers and said, can we design with you? What can we learn from you? What can you make? What can you do? How can we be supportive of your production methods? So in the, it's not just about being in a studio, drawing on a piece of paper, making a fantastic rendering that looks great, but then what is its connection to reality? So to me, like this project, the learning was that it was really rooted into reality. It was rooted in Italy. It was rooted in an international scene of what was happening in terms of design processes, in terms of technologies, and in terms of trends. Um, so that was the story of the project, and then how it led into um, a business opportunity uh, starts with the story of Salviati. So, as I said, the project, in the end, we all ended up uh, being um, working for, for Salviati on different aspects. And specifically, I work on the creative direction part, how to position the brand, how to communicate it outside, etc. And as I said, very privileged because you can see Salviati was founded in 1859. So it's a, it's a company that has got 158 years of history. They designed um, and made the mosaics that are nowadays in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. They designed mosaics for the Houses of Parliament in, in London and many others, like the uh, Monumental Cemetery in Milan. And again, it all started with innovation because in 1861, Mr. Salviati, he was in a market of very competitive people. Um, and um, he invented a way of um, making mosaics more functional and quicker to apply. So he basically created some uh, drawings that were easy to ship around the world, flat back. So cheaper to build in place and cheaper to, to ship. So in 1861, he was already thinking about innovation within mosaic tiles. And this is how he got all these commissions in the UK and how they founded the company in London. Um, so Getty nowadays, of course, is very different because it was you know, 150 years of history. So um, nowadays is mainly working oops, uh, with decorative objects for the house, so like vases, but they're also specialized in special projects. So there is loads of um, projects that I can't show you because there are some, some are confidential, some I just don't think they're relevant for the talk, but they do like big installations that work for interiors for Chanel shops, for Ritz Carlton hotels, so it's really high-end interior design projects. Um, but I'm just going to talk about more than the company, about my role in the company to um, stick to the topic of the talk. So we basically turned the showroom of Salviati into our studio. So we laid out all the products that were available, we made like a timeline of the products in time, analyzing different prices, different colors, and we started doing a deep research on what was available there in the company and how we could actually save what it was good and maybe uh, put aside and park what wasn't so powerful or relevant. Uh, we did a lot of um, color analysis, color research, loads of like workshops trying to understand you know, the positioning of the brand, what it is, what is the story, what can you tell about the brand, what is it that we can use to our favor, um, you know, not just as marketing words, but actual, you know, manifestation of a knowledge and that they master. And then working with colors, of course, like producing lots of different uh, samples, making that next to each other, understanding what's, what works as um, seasonal colors and what works in terms of uh, maybe colors that are not discontinued in the stay. So we got like some kind of old designs from the 50s and we started working out across like different ranges of color to make them a bit more modern. So the original one was transparent glass and gray, a little bit boring. 
and very, very seen. So we were like, okay, let's just go crazy. And we created like this range of very different colors that work with interior colors. So whatever is relevant today in terms of interiors. And for instance, this project, we talked to Maison Objet, and like a person came and he bought the whole set. It was like, I like this, as it is displayed, I'm gonna get them all. Um, or again, like this is a project that was done in 95, I think. Um, and we introduced new colors, so like understanding what could go together, um, doing studies on colors, what could be developed to fit the market better. Uh, and these are these were projects that we found through going to the archives. So again, the first thing we asked when we got in the company is like, can we see the drawings from the past? And then they opened the archives as the monocle video showed, and we just got back things that we thought were still really good and very relevant that could be a little bit updated. So this project, if you see the original one, very Murano tacky, you might not want it in your room necessarily. But then we updated like the colors and some techniques and the, the tactility of it. And this is like now in the collection with the new colors. And then it was all about applying all the skills that I've learned working for other clients um, and also breaking the mold. So corporate identity, what is your um, corporate logo? What does it look like? How does it feel? If it was a person, what would it say? So just do, doing like a big study on colors, on uh, printing techniques, uh, effects on paper, so everything you touch as an experience, as a user from Sabiati, tells something about the brand. And then redesigning the catalogs to be more modern, but also to fit needs of people that actually have to go out there and use the catalogs and sell the products. Or like some marketing materials, so these are just like quick sketches for something that we realize later. But like starting to visualize and test what could be and then producing it, testing it. And then another important aspect is how can you communicate something that, as I said before, is 150 years old. I mean, everyone, when you think about glass making, you've got this image in mind. So how can you make it different? How can you you know, think outside the box as a creative person to communicate the company in a different way, in a fresher way. So we got a photographer and of course we briefed the photographer um, to try and express the concepts that we wanted to express through photography. So the idea is that Sambiati is a magic place, but it's also a factory. Because, you know, it's not just about art glass, it's design. So design has to be reproduced and replicated in many numbers. So we played on this uh, contrast of something that is really sort of mystical as a place and something that is very um, um, contemporary and tangible. And then, of course, the Murano glass is the way it is because Murano is an island, so the influences of the sea, of the lagoon, of the water, they say in Venice, uh, the glass from Venice is a glass of fire and water. It's very different from the Scandinavian glass that is very uh, sort of geometric, very angular, and uh, in a way colder as well in colors. The Murano glass is warm and catches the warmth from the kilns, from the, the water that you can actually see from the factory. So if you open the window, this is what you see from the factory. And then, of course, it's about showing that it's all handmade, because it's a factory, but glass still needs to be handmade. So it's about showing the hands of the masters, but also the hands of a more modern process through quality control. So there is each piece is like it's been touched by numbers of pairs of hands. They like make it first, but then in a more modern way, they check the quality of it. And then, of course, it's about the materializing different aspects, it's not just the logo, the business card, and the objects, but it's also about the space. So this is a project that we actually did in collaboration with um, an Israeli designer that is now based in Venice, Omri Levitz. Um, and this is a stand that we produced for, for Saviati for Mission Object. And again, like with the simple signs, we got the elements from the logo, but also elements from Venice, because if you're familiar with Venice, all the windows are pretty much like this. So we decided that that was a strong element that we wanted to show in the spaces and in the architecture of the spaces. And then of course it was about 
testing materials and coders in a proper interior design sense of the project. And then we came up with this. Um, there was, it's a very light structure that references, uh, of course, the elements from Venice, it's got the logo, but everything is uh, reusable, so it's not like a stand that you chuck away, wasting like hundreds and hundreds of kilograms of, uh, of materials. Um, and it's also, despite Salgati being a luxury brand, because the buses are really expensive, we wanted it to feel calming, we wanted it, it we didn't want it to be tacky and in a way cheesy, we just wanted the environment to feel like, a little bit like home, so very relaxing and very quiet. But of course, like, with precious elements like golden surfaces and golden parts. And this is pretty much how, as an experience, starting from um, a project like Breaking the Mold, we ended up uh, applying all the learnings from a project into something that is actually a job today. Thank you very much.